Hey everybody, my name is Megan Galloway, and today we're gonna start a two-part series on the common discomforts of pregnancy. We'll talk about what's normal and what's not normal for most people. So if you like this video and you wanna follow along, make sure to like and subscribe. Let's be honest, pregnancy is not a walk in the park for most people. It's usually pretty hard, even while it can be very magical. The great news is though, you get a prize in the end. I don't think there are a lot of things in this life that come along with a prize in the end when they're really hard, but for this one, you get a baby. So let me reassure you that while pregnancy may be hard, it's very worth it for most people. To start this video off, I'm going to give you an outline of the topics we'll be covering. There are a lot of pregnancy discomforts to go over, and so we're gonna break them up into two parts throughout this video series. So in the end, we'll have talked all about nausea and vomiting, fatigue, insomnia, breast tenderness, constipation, headaches, dizziness, spotting, UTIs, vaginal infections, cramping, Braxton Hicks contractions, low back pain, Ron ligament pain, sacroiliac joint pain, symphysis pubic pain, restless leg syndrome, carpal tunnel syndrome, swelling, and last Lastly, heartburn. Oof, that was a long list, and honestly, it's probably not even exhaustive. So feel free to follow along fully with both videos or to skip ahead to the pregnancy discomfort that you're feeling so that you can learn a little bit more about it. I'm going to give you examples of what's normal, some things you can do to combat those symptoms, and when you might wanna call your healthcare provider. In general, this video is not meant to be medical advice. It's meant to give you some tips and tricks to help you get through the pregnancy with just a little bit more ease. First up, we're going to talk about nausea and vomiting in pregnancy, also known as morning sickness for most people. Now, this is one of the first symptoms that a lot of people experience when they're pregnant, and it's pretty uncomfortable. The great news is most of the time it goes away after the first trimester. And while sometimes in rare occasions it can actually come back, it usually resolves itself between 14 and 16 weeks. So if you're having a lot of nausea and vomiting in your pregnancy, just hang in there because it will likely get better. Nausea and vomiting are usually pretty manageable while they are pretty common. They can most of the time be managed with just some simple dietary changes, some supplements, and potentially some medications. The first rule of thumb in nausea and vomiting is to never let your stomach get empty. This seems counterintuitive because you're nauseous and so you don't feel like eating. But if you make sure that you're eating or snacking at least every two to three hours, you're gonna feel a lot better throughout your pregnancy. Most people find that all they want in the first trimester is carbs. And while you may feel guilty about only eating mac and cheese, crackers, and mashed potatoes, you're likely going to start feeling better in your second trimester and you can adjust your eating habits habits then. My general rule of thumb is keep yourself from getting empty so that you feel better no matter what it is you're eating. Next, try to not drink all of your fluids at the same time. Another good rule of thumb for nausea is to take your fluids 15 minutes at a time. So every 15 minutes, fill your mouth with water, drink it, and then don't drink anything else for 15 minutes. The other thing is you can avoid drinking while you're eating. This in general just keeps everything from sloshing around inside your stomach, so it tends to help you feel better throughout the nauseous period. For supplements, anything with peppermint or ginger is usually pretty helpful. Some people also like something called Prego Pops, which are just suckers that help with nausea. You can wear an acupressure relief band as well, and sometimes that helps. Those are usually meant for things like motion sickness, but they can help in pregnancy. There's a vitamin called B6, which can be helpful. It's mostly helpful when combined with Unisom, which is an over-the-counter sleep aid, but you can take it by itself and sometimes that helps too. When taking Unisom and B6 together, it's really helpful at preventing morning sickness if you take them together the night before. Most people take one Unisom and one B6 at nighttime, and then they continue the B6 every six hours throughout the day. Unisom can make you pretty tired, and so most people don't continue taking Unisom throughout the day, but you could do that both at morning and at night if you really are struggling with nausea and it's not making you too fatigued. Oh, and speaking of morning sickness, if you wake up at all in the middle of the night, make sure to keep something to eat by your bedside like crackers. Again, the best thing to do is to keep your stomach from getting empty. And so if you wake up at night and you put something in your stomach, you're much less likely to have morning sickness when you wake up in the morning. If the nausea and vomiting is bad enough that you're vomiting so much that you can't keep anything down for 24 hours plus, 
you should make sure that you talk to your healthcare provider or go to the emergency room. You'll likely need IV fluids and some IV anti-nausea meds to make it stop. So if you're thinking it's getting to that point, make sure to talk to your healthcare provider earlier so they can prescribe you medications that prevent nausea and vomiting so you don't end up having to get IV fluids. There's something rare called hyperemesis gravidarum, which is a nausea and vomiting disorder of pregnancy that makes you have vomiting throughout the day over and over and over again. People who have this disorder are often dehydrated and can be losing weight in the first trimester especially. It doesn't usually get better after the first trimester, but sometimes does improve. Hyperemesis is very rare, but if you do have hyperemesis, you will likely need multiple anti-nausea meds, IV fluid, and sometimes stay in the hospital in order to help it get better. So if you think your nausea and vomiting is bad enough that this could be your diagnosis, again, make sure to talk to somebody about it because you might need more help than just over-the-counter supplements. Nausea is one of the most common symptoms of pregnancy. It can usually be managed by some of the tips and tricks we've already talked about, and your healthcare provider can often prescribe medications that can help you. Remember, hydration is really important for you and your baby's safety. And so if you are struggling with nausea and vomiting to the point where you are unable to stay hydrated, you need to seek help. Next, we'll talk about fatigue. Fatigue is also very common in pregnancy and mostly in the first trimester, although some women notice a little bit of an uptick again in the third trimester, which is not usually as bad as the first trimester. Again, just like nausea and vomiting, fatigue is mostly resolved between the 14 and 16 week mark, but until then, you're likely to feel very tired and need a lot of naps. But this is normal. It's okay if you're experiencing fatigue. You are growing a tiny human, and that takes a lot of energy. Fatigue can sometimes be combated with naps, going to bed early, making sure to say no to things that you don't have the energy for, and then some supplements can help. You can take a B vitamin complex or just vitamin B12 itself. You can also take vitamin D. This can be helpful to combat fatigue as well. One of the other things you can do to combat fatigue is exercise, which much like eating when you're nauseous is counterintuitive, exercising when you're fatigued seems counterintuitive, but exercise naturally gives you energy and helps you stay awake throughout the day. Sometimes it's harder in the first trimester because you just feel terrible, but once you get out of that first trimester, make sure to try to return to normal exercise so that your body feels better throughout the day. Fatigue in the third trimester is often a product of insomnia, which is the next topic we'll cover. Insomnia is common throughout pregnancy, but usually has a pretty big uptick in the third trimester. This is because of a few factors. Most of them are external, one of which is discomfort. You're bigger in the third trimester, and so it's oftentimes harder to lay in bed and feel comfortable. I always recommend making sure your mattress is a good mattress for you. If your mattress is really old and you're finding it very uncomfortable to sleep on, you may need to consider switching mattresses. You should also consider pillow forting yourself, which means grab every pillow in the house and put it under every part of you that hurts while you're sleeping. They also make these great U-shaped pregnancy pillows these days, and you can use one of those instead if you don't wanna use a lot of different pillows. But support your belly, support your low back, support your knees, All these things help you get a better night's sleep. A couple of other things that cause insomnia, getting up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom. This isn't really something that you can make go away. Your bladder is being pushed on by your uterus and your baby, especially in the third trimester. And so you're gonna have a lot of urinary frequency. The other thing is anxiety. If you find that your mind is racing a lot before bed and you can't turn your thoughts off, this could be anxiety. It's very common as you approach the end of pregnancy, your mind is thinking about all all kinds of things like, where's the baby going to sleep? How's the nursery coming along? How's this birth thing gonna go? And oh my gosh, I forgot, I'm gonna have to take care of a tiny human after this is over. While these things can keep you awake and can keep your mind running, it's not common to have them overtake your thoughts. That's what we call pregnancy anxiety, and that's something you should talk to your healthcare provider about. So while some of these thoughts are normal, if you have any concern about how your mind and how your anxiety is working in pregnancy, please talk to your healthcare provider because you may need help more than just telling you to turn your mind off. To combat insomnia, one of the first things we need to talk about is sleep hygiene. Sleep hygiene means you really need to prepare your body to go to sleep. And the best thing you can do for that is turn off every screen and enjoy some actual human interaction. Or if you need some time to yourself, read an actual book 
something that has pages you can turn. Screens can disrupt the naturally occurring melatonin production that helps us go to sleep at night. So turning off your screens increases your body's natural melatonin production and therefore helps you fall asleep. You can also use things like meditation, relaxation techniques, deep breathing techniques, or even there are lots of sleep apps out there. Just make sure that you're listening to these and not looking at them on a screen. A warm bath may help you go to sleep. And again, exercise is really important because it makes your body tire out so that it's ready for bed at nighttime. If you struggle to go to sleep and you feel like you need something to help you sleep at night, magnesium is a really good over-the-counter supplement and you can take one of those before bed at night. You can also safely take Benadryl, Unisom, Dramamine, and Meclizine to help you go to sleep at night. The great thing about these is usually they do help you go to sleep. The bummer thing about these is that they can actually make it harder for you to be able to go to sleep in the future because they can be habit forming. So if you take these things every night, you may not be able to sleep without them in the future. Next, we'll talk about breast tenderness. Breast tenderness and breast growth are also most commonly noticed in the first trimester. You also may notice that you have some leaking from your breast throughout your pregnancy, and this is a good sign, but not a necessary sign, that you will be able to lactate after your baby is born. If you don't notice leaking throughout your pregnancy, that's okay. But if you don't notice breast tenderness or breast growth during your pregnancy, you may wanna talk to your healthcare provider about what it means for your breastfeeding chances. Breasts that don't grow during pregnancy could mean that you don't have enough milk supply once your baby is born. So if you're concerned about your breast changes or lack thereof, make sure to bring it up at one of your prenatal appointments. Now let's talk about constipation. Constipation is really common throughout pregnancy. It can start from the very beginning and last the entire time. There are three main reasons why this happens. The first of which is progesterone. Progesterone is the predominant pregnancy hormone, and what it does is slow the movement of food through the digestive tract. This can effectively cause constipation because your food is not moving normally throughout and therefore gets stuck inside your digestive tract. This makes it harder for digested food to move throughout the digestive tract and effectively causes constipation. The second cause of constipation is dehydration. In pregnancy, your blood volume increases significantly, and it is really hard to keep all that volume hydrated with fluid intake. And so fluid is really, really important at making the bowels go naturally. And if you are dehydrated, you're likely to be constipated. The third and last reason you become constipated during pregnancy is because as the uterus enlarges, it moves the intestines out of the way of their natural position. This makes it hard for them to move normally and therefore causes constipation. You can combat constipation in a lot of different ways, but the first one is by staying hydrated. You are gonna feel like I am running this hydration recommendation into the ground, but the reality is for most of the discomforts of pregnancy, hydration is the key to fixing it. You should also make sure you're getting plenty of fiber. Fiber can be naturally found in food sources, or you can also take a supplement. Some pregnant women use prunes in order to increase their fiber intake. Some people like prunes, I personally like them, but some people don't. They tend to be a good option, but they are not the only option. You can also make your own little stool softener recipe at home. The recipe is one cup of applesauce, one cup of bran or flax, and a quarter cup of prune juice. You mix it all together, put it in the refrigerator, and take one to two tablespoons a day. This typically helps keep you more regular. And if you don't like that on its own, you can mix it with some oatmeal or some yogurt, and it might taste a little bit better for you. Over-the-counter constipation aids are usually pretty safe in pregnancy. You can use citrusel or meta Musil, Colace, which is docusit sodium, Miralax, Milk of Magnesia, or Natural Valley Calm Supplement, which is a magnesium supplement. I don't recommend taking laxatives during pregnancy because they can actually make you more dehydrated or make the problem worse. But if you're struggling with constipation, make sure to talk to your healthcare provider about your options. But you can use some of these tips and tricks if you want to try to handle things on your own for a while. Okay, on to the next subject. Headaches. Headaches tend to be very common in pregnancy, especially during the first half of pregnancy. And if you tend to be more prone to headaches or migraines before you were pregnant, you're likely to get a little bit of an uptick during pregnancy. Headaches are often hormonal in nature, but they also come because, you guessed it, 
you're dehydrated, or your blood sugar is low. And we can combat these by staying hydrated and making sure to snack every two to three hours. For those of you who are struggling with headaches, who aren't having success by staying hydrated and keeping your blood sugar up with snacks, I like to recommend magnesium. Magnesium you can find over the counter in the supplement aisle. Usually I recommend starting with 250 milligrams a night before bed. And if you can tolerate this, because GI upset is kind of common with magnesium, then you can increase it to 500 milligrams a night for headache prevention. Magnesium is a great supplement during pregnancy. It not only helps prevent headaches, but it also helps with constipation, helps you sleep better, and helps your muscles stay relaxed. There are some safe headache medications out there. We typically start with 1,000 milligrams of Tylenol every six hours. If this is helpful, great. If not, you may need to talk to your healthcare provider. And if you get migraines frequently, you need to talk to your healthcare provider about what migraine medications might be safe for you. And while headaches can be common, they're only normal if they are not severe or prolonged. If you find that your headaches are going away because you rested, hydrated, you ate something, you took Tylenol, and that makes those headaches resolve, that's great. That is a normal pregnancy headache. But if you find that it's severe or it is not going away no matter what you do, you need to talk to someone or go to the ER immediately. This could be a very dangerous thing that's happening and you want to be evaluated immediately. Speaking of things with your head, let's talk a little bit about dizziness. Dizziness can also be common in pregnancy, and normally it happens because you're dehydrated or your blood sugar is low. Are we sensing a theme here? The other reason is sometimes because your blood pressure is low. If you find yourself feeling dizzy, sit down or make sure to pull over if you're driving, have a snack, have some water, and wait for it to pass. If it passes on its own, great. That is a normal thing that can happen in pregnancy. If it's coming along with chest pain, with shortness of breath, or you actually pass out, you need to be evaluated. On to the next subject, spotting. Spotting can be normal in pregnancy, especially in the first trimester. Spotting can happen because of implantation of the pregnancy, it can happen after intercourse sometimes, or it can happen because you've just had a really busy day or done a heavy workout. Spotting in pregnancy, especially in the first trimester, often comes from the cervix itself and doesn't actually impact the pregnancy. Spotting can also be associated with urinary tract infections or vaginal infections. Now, if you're having spotting in pregnancy, you're likely having a bit of a freak out. And I can't say that I blame you. Spotting can be associated with miscarriage and sometimes is a warning sign. But the good news is that spotting often has a really reasonable explanation and it is isn't actually harmful to the pregnancy. Now, when you're having spotting, your mind is automatically going to go to miscarriage, and I can't blame you for that. Miscarriage symptoms are often spotting or bleeding that are also associated with pain, usually in the form of cramping. If you are having painless bleeding, this is usually a good sign. Any spotting during pregnancy is likely going to make you be a little bit nervous. So try not to freak out immediately. If you're having spotting, make sure to talk to your healthcare provider, but hopefully there's a very reasonable explanation for it. If you're having heavy bleeding, that's a different story. And if you're concerned about how heavy your bleeding is, you need to go to the emergency room to be evaluated. So I just mentioned UTIs and vaginal infections, and both both of these are very common in pregnancy. Urinary tract infections happen mostly because of the changes of pregnancy. The uterus gets bigger throughout the pregnancy, and so just like how it moves the bowels aside, it also puts a lot of pressure on the urinary tract system, which makes bacteria grow and collect a little bit easier. This is usually what causes UTIs. Now, if you've had a UTI before, you probably know the symptoms. It burns when you pee, you have trouble emptying your bladder, and you feel like you have to pee constantly. These can be symptoms of UTI during pregnancy, but UTIs in pregnancy can also be completely silent, which is super annoying. Or they can just be some cramping, and that's your only symptom. Or you may have spotting, and you think it's coming from your vagina, but it's actually coming from your urinary tract system. Vaginal infections are also very common in pregnancy. Usually the hormones of pregnancy change the pH of the vagina a little bit to make vaginal infections more frequent. So you may find that during pregnancy, 
you get more yeast infections than you usually do, or you may find that you get something called bacterial vaginosis. Now, not everybody has heard of bacterial vaginosis, but it's, again, very common. It's basically the opposite of a yeast infection. So while a yeast infection is an overgrowth of yeast in the vagina, bacterial vaginosis is an overgrowth of bacteria in the vagina. Vaginal infections are pretty much the same whether you're pregnant or not. So you're likely going to get some discharge, some odor, some itching, some burning, and you may even get a little bit of spotting or cramping. You can help prevent UTIs and vaginal infections by some basic hygiene tricks. Make sure you're wearing only cotton underwear. Change out of sweaty workout clothes immediately. Make sure that you're peeing after sex. You should also shower regularly, wear loose-fitting pants, and it's a good idea to sleep without underwear on. The vagina likes to breathe. Make sure you're also avoiding products like wipes, different soaps with fragrances, and douching, which I don't think is really around much anymore, but some of you may be trying it. You can also take a probiotic that's specifically formulated for women's health. They usually say that they're good for urinary tract health or for vaginal health. Cranberry supplements are safe in pregnancy, and you guessed it, hydration is key for preventing and treating urinary tract infections. But if you do think that you have a UTI or a vaginal infection, you'll need to talk to your healthcare provider because most of them do need to be treated with medications. We'll end here for today. No sense overwhelming you with talking about everything at once. We'll pick up in our next video by starting with the topic of cramping and talking about the next 10 topics on our list. If you have questions or thoughts about pregnancy, pregnancy discomfort, feel free to comment below and we can chat about it. Otherwise, make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel so that you can catch the next 10 items in the pregnancy discomfort talk. Thanks for watching, good luck out there, and stay healthy everybody.